Sixth. Sixth, yeah, I almost said seventh. 80 years from yeah. D-Day. Yeah. Okay, Today. well, I, I, I'm told yeah, this yeah. is the anniversary of D-Day. Yeah. So anyway, um, we're here at 515 South Division Street. Um, today, I uh, had my agenda changed, not by myself, but um, the Holy Spirit woke me up three Saturdays ago and said, I don't want you to teach on John tonight. You're going to teach on the four methods I gave you 15 years ago to understand scripture. So we're going to talk about those tonight. Um, and if you follow them, I hope I do um, an, a good enough job because it is actually beautiful and it's infallible that um, if you do it properly, you cannot interject your own opinion and you will come up with God's opinion, which is the only one that matters. Um, I say this all the time if you see me in person. Um, that one day I will stand before him and he's not going to ask me how I fared against what I believed. He's going to ask me how I lived according to what he believed um, because there's nowhere in scripture where he's asked my opinion and he never will. So um, I want, I, I want, he really wanted me to teach this um, and I, like I say, I hope I do an adequate job of it. Um, but like I say, many of you know me so if, if, if you have further questions, and I know some of you will, some of you call me every day, which is fine. I love that. Um, um, so um, I'm more than happy to answer questions all the time. So we're going to get started tonight, um, and, and I'll do the best I can. Um, first, we're going to start and ask the Holy Spirit to, to give us wisdom, um, and then we'll get going. Heavenly Father, we glorify you. We thank you for everything you've done for us. We thank you for sending your son, Father, that, that we could spend all eternity with you is the only way we have of making it um, into, into your kingdom. We thank you that you are so loving, so kind, and so just. Lord, give us wisdom tonight that we will know your will, and we will, in this study, will help people all, all around the, the state, the city, the country, wherever people see it. Lord, help them to, to better understand the methods and, the, and understand how you think. Um, because once we see the way you think, uh, it is absolutely beautiful. In your precious name, amen. Now, we're going we're gonna to go on this, and I, and I promise you that we're going to be on some rabbit trails. And I'll try and keep, keep them on track, but we will be on some rabbit trails. So there are four methods, according to God, and, and I... He gave me these 15 years ago. He gave me the explanation of them. I never heard a name. I just thought they were four methods he wanted me to use. I didn't know anything about that they were actual methods that were have been used for, dec for centuries and centuries and millennia. Um, until five years later, I heard someone, Perry Stone to be exact, say that there are four methods in Hebrew of studying scripture. And he gave the names, and I went to the Jewish Learning Center to find it, because he didn't clarify them. He just mentioned there were four of them. And I went there, and I researched them. And it was all of what he had given me, plus he gave me one additive to each one of the four methods. And I will cover that also. So here we are, uh, four methods of understanding God's word. Here's the first one. It's called Peshat. Peshat means to review and study a single verse. Understand it in context. So if I take a verse and I and I and I and I look at the context around it, um, um, that that would be um, studying that is Peshat, where I'm where I'm take I'm just solely focused on one verse, and most of us do that when we read scripture. We we study one verse, but the but the second method becomes a little more complicated. Now Ramez, these are Hebrew words, Ramez to view multiple verses in order to prove the um, uh, uh, understanding of the verse verse, uh, cannot alter the literal meaning of the first verse. Those, this last statement is what he gave me that I did not see in the Jewish description, which means if, if I come up with, he, and he gave me the verses he wants me to discuss tonight, so, uh, and because he said that this is the number one issue that's destroying the church. So, um, um, if, if, if I take the, um, multiple verses and compare them to the, to the first verse that I'm actually trying to study, 
the these verses, um, if I if if I take them and compare them to this verse, and I formulate an opinion that changes the meaning of this single verse, then my opinion is wrong. Or actually, I should say it's my opinion, not God's. So I am wrong. Um, and, and this will make more sense in a minute when we start actually taking actual verses. The third one is drash. It's an allegorical meaning of the passage of Scripture. Must agree with the literal meaning of Peshat and Remez of the passage context, or you are wrong. Again, it, it's a verification that when I'm studying uh, the allegorical meaning in Scripture, it, it, has, to, it, it has to jive with um, Remez and Peshat, otherwise I am wrong. Um, and that's an interesting concept, and it's, and, but it takes a tremendous amount of discipline. Now, what is allegorical? Allegorical, one example is when Jesus tells a parable. Um, if I take the parable, and, and I have heard so many bad interpretations of, of allegorical statements or parables in Scripture, um, and it's because they don't take it all the way back to the root and where and, and to find a ver the verse that it actually correlates to or the or the verses which then the verses will then bring you back this when you're studying allegorically um, and, and to try and find the meaning of it this should take you back to here when you find multiple verses that connect th with this and then once I find these verses then I should be able to go back and prove this statement using that now if that hopefully that makes sense to you and I, I, I am I being clear I mean I don't want to lose anybody especially at the beginning so that is drosh whether it's a parable of um, the 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 ten virgins five wise five foolish or whether it's the the five talents two talents and one talent those are all parables but they actually have they do actually have literal meaning and we can prove those. The fourth one is sowed. And sowed is a type or a shadow um, within the scripture. It must agree with all of the above. Now, sowed is a type and a shadow, and I'll use an example. Um, uh, in the book of Numbers, I want to say it's Numbers chapter 22 um, or 19. It's the serpent on the pole in the wilderness. Um, and God told Moses to ra raise up a serpent on a pole, and anyone who looked on it would be healed of the venomous snake bites that God, God had sent the vipers because of, of what they had done. They had sinned against God, and God was angry. So he, he sent the vipers to bite them, and they repented, and God said, okay, put up this pole and put a serpent on it, and if they look upon that serpent, um, they will be healed. So um, that, that serpent is actually a, and, and serpent on the pole is actually a symbol of Jesus, what he would one day do and be put on a cross. Now, how do we know that Jesus is, that that's a type and a shadow? First of all, Jesus said so. In John chapter 3, he said, just as the, the, um, the, the Israelites had to, had to rise, raise up a serpent on a pole in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up um, and crucified so he himself made the comparison and I've had people say to me well that's sacrilege because you're saying the serpent on the pole serpent always represents sin and Jesus was without sin I said not when he was on the pole he wasn't because it's in, in if he if he was then Jesus himself is a wrong and if Jesus is wrong because he knows the end from the beginning he can't be wrong he can only be lying or telling the truth so because when you know the answers and you and you mislead someone then that would be a lie and in, in, and if the, every verse in the bible is jesus then if we alter a verse we are actually altering jesus technically so the verse um in second corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 it says he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so he became sin our sin so that he so that that sin could one day be forgiven on that cross and it happened as we have discussed before i believe when caiaphas slapped jesus on the face and declared blasphemy that was the symbol of yom kippur the sins of the people of israel being transferred onto jesus and then jesus took all of those sins onto the cross 
he could not die with those sins on him or he had no, no access to heaven because sin cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So if you look at historically in the Old Testament, whatever they used to purify sin, they used it in the, in the synagogue. The, the high priest used it over the people on Yom Kippur, sprinkled blood seven times over the people with a hyssop branch. It was hyssop that always was the purification factor. It was what God told Moses to use when he purified the water that was rancid. So how does that interact with Jesus? Well, in John chapter, it's only in the book of John, chapter 19, it says, Jesus said, I thirst. And they put, took a sponge and they pushed it, put it, this is the only verse that says what kind of pole it was. It was a hyssop branch, a pole. So when they put that to his mouth, he didn't drink it. He, t he, he, he tasted it and turned his head and said, now all scripture has been fulfilled because he is now been cleansed of the sin that he took upon himself when Caiaphas slapped him. Because he couldn't die with it. Would have changed everything. So I say that because I know that's, that I didn't, that's an unintentional rabbit trail. I didn't intend to go there. Um, but um, but that, that is, a, that is a, an example of sowed or a type and a shadow because that pole and that serpent are a type and a shadow of who Jesus was going to be. So I hope that now, now with Sod, when I see it, when we take a scripture and we compare it to see if it matches something in the future, and especially from, from an Old Testament scripture um, to a New Testament, that to me that's the best because I need to have a, something from the Old Testament to compare to the New Testament to make sure if I can't find that, then I won't teach on it. So this type in a shadow must, must, um, agree with and not alter the meaning of the allegory and the allegory must agree with and not alter the meaning of um, the, the multiple verses which is Ramez and the multiple verses must go back and support the original meaning of the verse that you have found. Now I know that's a tremendous amount of work um, and you really have to love and be seeking and, and you've heard me say a hundred times it, that you, the, the key to knowing Jesus is seeking. And Jesus said, if you, and he said this in the Old Testament, he said it in the New Testament. And I know, fortunately, I don't get letters, but if, I, but if I did get letters, I would get letters and say, wait a minute, where did Jesus speak in the Old Testament? Jesus is the Old Testament. He's also the New Testament. Every word in that book, as we have talked before, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God since the since eternity. Proverbs eight twenty two through thirty says that that he um, he came from eternity and he was always always every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, because when G, when God thought something Jesus spoke. That's the way it worked. Still does. So now we're going to move on, and I hope you got this. And if not. Um, we're going to be going back and forth with this for a while. Um, okay, here's, an ex here's the example that God wanted me to use, which is Peshat, um, Genesis 1, verses 26 um, through 28. Now, I'm going to stop after we do 27, and there's a reason for that. I'll show you. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Now, notice we are made in his image. After our likeness let them rule over the fish of the sea over the flying creatures of the sky over the livestock over the whole earth and over every crawling creature that crawls on the land now we've talked about this before when it says let us make man he's talking about god being through plural obviously we know that um unless you're an orthodox jewish person you're we all i think we all accept that he is more than one um, um, when it says he is, we are made in, in Adam was made in, in his image, uh, their image, that means that whatever they looked like, two ears, two eyes, a mouth, a nose, two hands, two feet, that's, that's what God made Adam after himself, after the, himself, because God is perfect. But then it says after our likeness, the three, which means now they're three in one. We were made as three in one, spirit, soul, and flesh. 
Let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the flying creatures of the sky, over the livestock, over the whole earth, and over every crawling creature that crawls on the land. Um, so this is telling you that under the Edomic covenant, we have full authority. Adam had, had every, all full authority over everything. Adam and Eve. Now, in, um, in the book called The Garden, I think it was called The Garden or The Garden of Eden, written by Josephus. And Joseph, Jesus would have been, he was crucified in 32 AD. Josephus was born in 33 AD. So, um, Je obviously, Josephus never met Jesus personally. Um, they have met him spiritually, but not personally. Um, and so, um, he wrote that every animal in the garden spoke, had a voice. I think it's interesting because if you look, I don't, I don't have YouTube, I don't, I don't watch any of those social media stuff, but um, I do watch them replayed on news channel or whatever, and you see a dog and they, they, they want to give him a treat and they make him say a word. Now that dog doesn't know what that word is, but it just shows you that at one time, that dog, the dog has the capability of saying words. And it goes back to what Josephus said, that, there, that every animal in the garden spoke. Um, and I think that's interesting. Now, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, all of this, the power, the authority over every creeping thing, the power and authority over all the livestock, over every flying creature, all of that went to Lucifer. And, and Satan lost it. That's the Edomic covenant. Because when they sinned, they broke that covenant with God. Now, when Jesus went, died on the cross, when he gave up the, go, the spirit and went down into Sheol, it says he took back the keys to death, hell, and the grave. What would death, hell, and the grave? Well, what Adam lost here was power and authority. As we've mentioned before, God breathed part of himself into Adam. Um, and so when when when... Satan would have heard God declare his name into Adam. It doesn't say it in Scripture, but it kind of does in Isaiah 14, that he was that when Satan heard that, he actually is thinking, "This is my way back into heaven. This is my way back into power." He gave he gave his name, the power that I lost, he gave to Adam. But he didn't realize that when you look at this definition, everything in Scripture means something. So when you look at this, the power and authority that God gave to Adam was, was l limited to these creatures that he's mentioning, which the fowls of the air can only fly so high. So above that, God, man did not have a power and authority over that. I could go really on a rabbit trail right now to, talk, to prove that or to talk about that, but I, I really don't want to go that direction. Um, but anyway... Um, but we have the Adam and Eve had the power and authority up to as high as the the, the highest flying bird could go. Um, Satan took that, thinking that he would get back into heaven. But birds can't fly as high as heaven, so it didn't help him. Um, it helped him in some ways because then he be he he used his power and authority all through the Old Testament, because it wasn't returned to mankind until the New Testament believers. Then it says that. God took back the keys to death, hell, and the grave. He returned it to us. So right now, we have power and authority um, equal to what Adam and Eve had in the garden. Now, I've, I've told people that, and they think I'm nuts. And I'm okay with it, people. My wife thinks I'm nuts, so that's okay with me. Um, I, would, I am nuts for Jesus, and I want to know him literally and fundamentally. And I can tell you stories. And you'll, you will think I'm crazy. But I have stood in my backyard and commanded a tornado to separate and watched it separate. I have stood in my backyard and, and the first year I planted asparagus, it was supposed to take six weeks for them to pop up out of the ground and grow. Well, 10 weeks into it, not one of them had popped up yet. And I was furious. I went out in the backyard and I called them disobedient. I called them um, evil and wicked. And I said, you will bow to the authority given to me through Adam by Jesus, and I said, you will grow, and you will grow immediately. I went in, and I kid you not, and I'm not, I, I don't say this for my benefit, because it's Jesus that, 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 that does this stuff, but I walked out there and commanded them to grow. 
I went back in and had two peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, came back out, and I kid you not, they were six to eight inches tall. Now, did I do that? No. But my faith activated. You've heard me teach before. Faith is the currency of earth. Love is the currency of heaven. So we have to trade. We have to. We can only trade the amount of faith that we have. We can't. We can't trade more faith than what we have. We can trade the amount of faith for, that we have for the promises of the love of God. So we need to keep practicing that because the more we do it. And the more we, we can't get dejected when, when it fails, and it will fail sometimes. I've prayed for a lot of people. I've seen most of the people I pray for, I see Jesus heal. But there are some who don't. But does that make me quit? No. It doesn't have anything to do with me. Because if I take credit for the healing, then I also have to take credit when they don't get I have to take the blame when they don't get healed. And, and I don't want either one of those cases. So what I'm saying is, and I know this is another rabbit trail I did not intend to go on, but, but this is the Adamic covenant that, that we are living under if we are believers in Jesus Christ. When are we going to live like this? Romans chapter 8. Here's another rabbit trail. I, I probably won't get halfway through this thing tonight, but that's all right. Because if you look at Romans chapter 8, and people want to talk about global warming, well, we were going through a cold, global freeze back in the 70s and 80s, and then all of a sudden... Just like it's supposed to, the temperature changed and it got hotter. So now we, then we were going through global warming. Well, then the global warming turned back into moderation. So moderate. No, we're going through climate change now. I don't know what the acronym is they're going to come up with next. But um, I've had this d debates with heads of engineering from local colleges and who whoever, and and they get frustrated when you talk about it because I I will ask them, well what caused, do you believe in dinosaurs? And they'll say yes. And I said, me too, because the scripture's full of dinosaurs. So um, I said, but what caused them to die? And they'll say either a global freeze or a global. I said, oh, so when the cavemen drove semis and, and, and the noxious gases from the dinosaurs um, caused heating in, of the environment, which caused destruction of the dinosaurs, right? Oh, they get furious and walk away because they have no argument for that. I said, but but according to Paul in the book of Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 16 or 18, it says that the earth is groaning because of the weight of the sin that has been committed on it. And I am doing a little paraphrasing, but that's what it says. And then it says, it, it, the earth itself is anxiously awaiting the unveiling or the revealing of of the sons of God, who, since the first man Adam sinned, have not been have not been seen. So, the earth is revolting, not because cows have eaten too much gaseous alfalfa, or because we're flying too many planes or driving too many trucks or cars. It is because of the the sin that is committed, and and we don't you know as Christians, I don't think we see the heinous sins that are out there. God sees it all. What they do with children, what they do with... It, 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 there's no secret place from God. Um, and there's no secret place from the earth. And the earth has a spirit from God. We have a spirit of God. If you look... I don't care where you go. Psalms 90, Isaiah 55. Um, I can keep going. Romans 8. I, I, I don't want to... What I want to say is... Um, that the earth has a spirit from God. It says that the, the rivers and the, and the trees will clap their hands. The rocks in the, va in the valleys will sing his praise. Um, Jesus said, if, if my people are silent, the very stones will cry out. That was literal. He's not talking about something hypothetical. That's not a parable. He is, he is talking about, just like he says in all these scriptures in, in Isaiah 55, that the that the trees and the and the and the and the the mountains and the valleys will sing his praise. Well, he's not talking about people standing in the valley. If he was, he would have said that. He's talking about the literal trees and the valleys and the hilltops are going to praise him because nature loves him. Now they're not eternal. They don't have an eternal spirit because it's not of God. It's from God. 
I was teaching at a Jewish synagogue, and they said, where are you getting some of this stuff from? So I said, from your Torah, which you gave to me. Thank you very much. And so um, I, uh, I, uh, I, I, I said, well, go to Genesis chapter 9. Everything has free will. Everything, including animals, including rocks, including trees, including water, everything. And they said, how can you say that? I said, I didn't. God did. Again, I tell you, it's not my opinion that matters. It says in there that God said, I put, after the flood, he said, I put, in, in chapter 9 of Genesis, I put a fear of man in every beast of the field and fowl of the air and commanded them to be afraid. But if, if they shed the blood of man, by man's hand, their blood must be shed. So what is that saying? It's saying, I gave them a direct order, but they have free will to override that. If they do that, and we see it all the time, bears attack, sharks attack, but they have been commanded not to do that. And if they do that, it says that by man's hands, they must be judged. So they have a spirit. You can't, you can't re reject God and go against his will if you, without a spirit. But it's not an eternal spirit. You won't see sharks in hell, not even jaws. You won't see bears. You won't see alligators. You won't, you won't see those things. They're just dead because they have a spirit from God. Animal, or angels and humans have a spirit of God. That's why hell was created because he cannot destroy himself. We all have a, animals or um, angels and humans have a spirit of God, which is eternal. There's no destruction for them. There can't be because God can't destroy himself. So therefore, um, we have a spirit of God. We have part of him, part of his DNA. And I know I went, that went, goodness, I went way off on a, now where was I? And then 27, God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and conquer it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the flying creatures of the sky, and over every animal that crawls on the land. So, this is why he told me, that, verse 28, I, I, I used 26 and 27 to set up 28. So what was the purpose for, God, God created man, and then all the animals. Actually, he created the animals, and then he created man. But he saw that, that, that Adam was lonely. So he said, it is not good for man to be alone. Those are the verses before this. So then God created Eve. And Eve was to be a helper, someone who helped to help manage the Garden of Eden. So that being said, um, Adam was still not fulfilled. So in this verse, 28, God creates marriage. doesn't say it, but it does. If you look at God's laws, you cannot have intercourse unless you're married. And he says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. So I don't know, there was no immaculate conception or reception if you're, if you're a football fan. Um, so um, if, if, if they are multiplying, then in God's eyes, they're married. So the purpose, there's only one, one purpose mentioned for marriage. And this, this is the rule of first mention in Scripture. The first mention is that, that when God put man and wife together as married, a married couple, it was to multiply. And then it was multiply the whole earth. And what does that mean? To take, the Garden of Eden was a nursery. It, it, was, it was Motman's, or it was, you know, if you're from Hudsonville, it's WW Greenhouses. If, wh wherever you're from, there are greenhouses because West Michigan has more than anybody, according to Guinness Book of Records. So, so we, it, the, the Garden of Eden was a 1,500 mile by 1,500 mile by 1,500 mile greenhouse. It was their, God's long-term goal for them was to take the, the Garden of Eden and make the whole world a Garden of Eden. That was their directive. But... The first step was for them to populate so they would have helpers who God never intended for them to do all those things by themselves. 
And I guarantee these people started having children right away. I know I would. Um, and they were to fill the land with what? People. Fill the land with people and then conquer it. Conquer the land. How do you conquer the land? You plant, you, you, you they didn't have to weed. That's why I always say, when I get to heaven, the first thing I'm going to do, I won't remember, but I like to say it anyway. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do when I get to heaven, is kick Adam right in the shins. I'm tired of pulling weeds out of my garden. So I, I just want to point this out um, because this is, but this is the verse that the purpose of marriage was to have children. Now we're going to go on. Um, here's Ramez's portion of what we just that I only had Pashat. I only used one verse because that's what he told me to use. Um, now we're going to we're going to start getting into multiple verses to go back and compare to that one verse, verse 28, where he says that the purpose of marriage is to populate the earth with humans. Okay, Adonai Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall on man, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed it up, um, um, closed up the flesh in its place. Now, people will say, and I've heard people say this, okay, now, why does it say in, in, in Genesis 1, 26 and 27 that he created one man and then woman? But here it's saying that now he's repeating himself. People don't know how to read Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1 is a snapshot of, of all seven days of creation. Chapter 2, although there's a little bit of the pre-sixth day, chapter 2 is almost all entirely about the sixth day of creation. It, talks about the, it does talk about plants, but those, are, those were on day 5. Day 6, in the morning he created plants, and, er, he, not plants, he, he created animals, and then he created Adam, and then shortly after lunch... He creates, he creates Eve. So this is, not, this is not wrong. It's not out of place. It's just this is a snapshot of creating man and woman. Um, and I could go into a real deep study if you wanted on the names of Adam and Eve. Uh, Adam and Eve. Um, Adonai Elohim built the rib. I think this is interesting. Again, this is from the, the Tree of Life version. Uh, Adonai Elohim built the rib, which he had taken uh, from the man into a woman. Then he brought her to the man. So now God is presenting as a father, presenting the bride to the groom. This is why a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife. And they become one flesh. Now, we all know how we become one flesh. We just talked about that in Genesis 1, verse 28, that, that, that he, they were commanded to have children. You can only do that by one way. Now, I think, I think it's interesting. I love to say, why do most of us, um, and I think it's a blessing um, if, you can, if you can resist sexual desire and stay single, but I also think it's a blessing if you can't and you, and you get married, but you stay, cel you stay not celibate, but um, monogamous. Both ways. I, they're, you know, I get it. Um, I mean, I'm married. I've been married 43 years. So you can see that none of the, I think, I don't want to go back. All of these are d discussing marriage. And it goes back to um, this, the purpose. It does, you see that all three of those, not one of those changes the meaning of verse 28, which is to be fruitful and multiply. Multiply and cover the earth. So this, this is why Ramez used these, and I got more, but these verses here go back and they actually support the original meaning of the first verse that says, that the purpose to have a marriage is to have children. Now, why am I saying all this? We're leading into the fact that a man cannot have a child with a man, and a woman cannot have a child with another woman. 
Now, if you look in Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20, I'm talking chapters, not verses. Leviticus 8, chapter 18 and chapter 20, it talks about the abomination of man sleeping with man. And then, it's, and then it actually makes the very next, in 18 anyway, I didn't look up 20. But in 18, it follows that up and compares it directly to a woman having sex with an animal. That's how much it's disgusting to God. So this, and this is why he told me he wanted me to teach on this topic and show how you can prove what God's will is. Not what my will is. Not what these pastors are, are altering. And those pastors, I don't know if I include any of those verses, but th those pastors will answer one day um, because, because they've led people. When, when God said, and this doesn't just apply to pastors. This applies to me. It applies to all, you. It applies to any of you listening. That if you tell other people that it's God's okay with homosexual marriage or homosexuality or, or any of that, one day you will, it's, oh yeah, it, it is in here, so I'm going to hold off for a minute. Um, Ramez, Leviticus 18. You are not to lie with a man as a woman. Um, that is an abomination. And this next verse, 23, says um, that it, it and compares a woman to sleeping with an animal. Here's, here's the verse I was talking about. Romans 1. Therefore God gave them over to evil desires of their hearts to impurity, to dishonor their bodies one with another. Next verse. They traded the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creation rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. See what the... I mean, how many people... Do we know anybody that's an animal rights person? I think we all do. I think every one of us does. And I've known my share that, number one, a lot of them don't believe in God. If they do, then it's some kind of God, universal God that, that, is, that they kind of compare. They take bits and pieces of Buddhism and Hinduism. Um, they take some little bit of Christianity, a little bit of Islam. They mix it with transcendentalism, you know, whatever. But, but you cannot... You cannot love God and put creation above God because that, is, as we know, is idol worship. And it doesn't matter if it's a, it's a clay being. It doesn't matter if it's a sculpture of iron or if it's a tree that grows in, a redwood tree that grows in uh, California. You just can't. Um, or a dog that is sleeping next to my wife on, you know, on the couch. It's, you can't put that dog at that same level. They're, they're not. But that's what it says. And we see it. We see people trading. Look at global warming. We just talked about it. We're putting global warming above mankind. And people say, how are we doing that? Well, if you look at, um, I know for a fact, people like Bill Gates, Oprah Winfrey, uh, there, George Soros, there are many of them that get together on a, an annual basis to try and determine how many people, what the carrying capacity of the earth is, and how are we going to eliminate the others. Um, I've, heard, I've heard a varying no degree of numbers, some of which are 1.5 billion, which means they need to come up with a way to, to, to take out 4.5 to 5.5 billion people. That is their goal. Now, I could give my opinion on the, uh, um, on the vaccine, but I believe that played a role. Um, Anyway, Romans 1 continued, verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up uh, to shameful passions. Even their women exchanged natural relations um, for that which is against nature. Bear in mind, this is New Testament, right? Because I've had people say, well, Exodus and, uh, or I'm sorry, Le Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20 are Old Testament. And they said, Jesus never spoke to homosexuals. I said, that ought to tell you something. If he didn't speak to them, he had no hope for them. So, and I said, if, I said, but, but, I, I said, he did talk to them in Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20. And they said, well, that's Old Testament. I said, well, wait a minute. Was Jesus in, living in the Old Testament or the New Testament? They say New Testament. I said, no, it wasn't even written yet. He was creating it as he walked every day. But if you look in Galatians chapter 4, um, verse 4, it says, 
that Jesus was born of a woman under the law. And we've talked about that before because under the law means we've talked about video games and how, you know, everyone, you have to, you have to complete a level before you can go to the next. Well, Jesus was the only one that could complete, compete level one, which is the law. None of, no one else could do it. Once he competed, completed that, it made level two available to all of us because we got that free password called salvation that got them, you know, I, 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 I don't know this, but I, I've heard it or read it or somebody told me that if you pass a level, you can acquire a password somehow to give yourself a pass. You don't have to play that first level over again or the second level over again once you've completed it. Well, Jesus is that password. He is the one that brings us from the law to um, um, freedom of salvation. And, and um, it doesn't mean the law ceases to exist because it just means that he gave us access to live in purity and love our neighbors and love God and to love your neighbor as yourself and to love God with all your heart, according to Romans and um, Galatians, is fulfilling the law. So another rabbit trail, in case you were wondering. Um, verse 27, likewise, the men abandoned nature, natural relations with women and were burning with passion toward one another. Men committing shameful acts uh, with other men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. This is, again, all remez. This is all taking multiple verses, and they go back, and do they disprove? Do they change, alter the, the, the first verse we looked at, which is the main reason for, for um, marriage is for procreation? Not at all. Romans 1.32. Now, this is where it gets sticky. I can tell you another verse that it does the same thing. It makes you very uncomfortable. And when pastors try and tell me that God's okay with homosexuality, I said, no, God's not, but you are. I said, and you have created a Jesus you can live with, but you've also made, created a, yourself to be someone that Jesus can't live with. And you will be standing on the wrong side of the desk at the great day of judgment, the white throne judgment. Romans 1, though they know God's righteous decree. What is the righteous decree? That those are an abomination and the only purpose for sex and marriage is for procreation. That's his decree that those who practice such things deserve death. Now, is he talking about we should kill them? You know, because people say, well, are we supposed to stone them? Are we supposed to? No. This death, God only deals with spiritual death. Spiritual death is the second death. Once you've died naturally on earth, or if someone murders you or whatever, however you died, accident in a car accident, if you did not know Jesus, and more importantly, if Jesus did not know you, which is Matthew chapter 7, he said, depart from me, I never knew you. So if, you don't, if he doesn't know you, then, then this death he's talking about is death is eternity in hell. They not only do them, that those who practice such things deserve death, they not, uh, they not only do them, but also approve of others who practice the same. Now, I've looked that up in the Greek, and I've laid out the words. Um, and if I look at it in Greek, it actually, this, this last part right here means that if I stand by the side and, and applaud someone and say, you have every right to be gay, I am so happy for you. You found your path in life. Life is good. Let me vote for a candidate that, that will support this. Let, you know, I'm throwing out things, but those are real. If we vote for candidates that do things that are contrary to God's word, then we are taking part in the evil of their deeds. Now go to Second John. Uh, there's only one chapter in Second and Third John, but Second John, chapter one, verses seven through eleven. If someone comes to you preaching a false gospel and you wish them Godspeed, which means if I cast a vote for them, or wish them a success on their journey, that's what it means. Um, that that I will be that I will get, serve the same judgment that they have that they have received because it, it, it doesn't matter if it's my pastor from my pulpit or or if it's a pastor um, or someone someone else that's not even a Christian that I follow if I am doing what is contrary to God's word and 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 doing things that are caught 
God said, if you cause one of these little ones, and I have a lot of people say to me, but these people love Jesus. No, they don't. They love themselves. Because they're saying to Jesus, I don't care what you said. I'm going to live the way I want to live. You're going to have to live with it. But guess what? He doesn't have to. This is your world, or his world, not your world. And the next world, both, both of them are his world. He gets to decide who goes where, not you. So we have to be careful because he said, if, if you cause one of these little ones, and supposedly all of these, a lot of these people will say, I'm a Christian, but I'm, but I'm just gay. Well, no, you're not, because you're not following Jesus. And that's what, a Christ, that's what the word Christian means, follower of Jesus. You're not following his way or his will. But it says, if you cause someone else to do the same, that um, he says, if you cause one of these little ones who believes in me to fall away, it would be better for you if you were never born. Now, we need to think about that when we're stating these bold statements and saying, yeah, well, my pastor looked it up, and he says that God's okay with homosexuality. Yeah, okay. Okay. You're going to have to live and die with that, what you just said. Or you've got to repent, one of the two. But you can't. You can't side with Lucifer and then claim to be a follower of Christ. You can't. I mean, all of these sins go back to uh, liberal theologies, all the way back to Moloch and Seamus and Ishtar and Ashtaroth and Ra. I mean, I could just keep going and naming the gods. They all, they all did the same thing. They all sponsored abortion. And they all sponsored homosexuality. Where do you think Sodom and Gomorrah came from? These, these are all worship. All of these demonic gods required that. They would actually have temple prostitutes that were male and female. And no matter what gender you were, you could choose whatever one you wanted. That's just part of demonic worship. That's what, that's what we see. And I know I'm speaking harshly. And I'm not trying to make friends. I'm trying to make brothers and sisters. Friendships don't do me any good. Because unless you know Jesus, it's just a temporary thing anyway. Friendship. I'm not planning on going. I'm not going to make house calls and I'm not going to visit. Okay, Matthew 25. Now we're getting into drash. Drash um, is where it's an allegorical type situation. And this, we're going to, believe it or not, we're going to be able to take this all the way back to the, to the first verse that we, we looked at, Genesis 1, 28, where um, it talks about the purpose for marriage. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who, who took their lamps and, and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. Uh, for when the foolish ones took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise ones took oil in their jars along with their lamps. Now, this is talking about preparing for a Jewish marriage, wedding. And now, if, if we talk about, and, and if you have any, any um, history, in a, in a, especially in a spirit-filled church, where we're talking about um, what water, if it, unless it's a specific water, like they're talking about the Jordan River, but if they're just generically talking about water or oil, um, they tend, water and oil, both, each one of them can, can um, be an example of the Holy Spirit. So if I look at these ten virgins, it says they all had oil. All five of them, or all ten of them, knew Jesus. In today's, in, in the, in the, not in the parable, but, but they all knew the groom, and they knew the bride. Um, which is a symbol of, the, of people in a church, and they're saying, well, all ten of these had the Holy Spirit. But some of them said, yeah, but he's not coming today. Let's, have, let's go out and, you know, let's go out to the bar, let's go out to... We, they took the cares of this world and put them over the cares of, of Jesus. Now, five of them said, no, no. I want to seek God. I want to study. I want to go to Bible groups. I want to. I want to. I want to hang around Christians. I want to. I want more oil. And they had plenty. 
The five of them said, you know what? I accepted Jesus when I was seven. I was baptized at 12. I'm good. We just talked about something like that before we got here tonight. I'm good. I don't need any more. I'm happy. I know where I'm going. Do you? Maybe you do. I don't know. It's above my pay grade. I'm just warning you that Jesus is impressed with people who continually seek him. Now, we've talked about what it means in, in, to a Jew when we use the word fulfill. Because in the New Testament, it talks about the, the, the cup being fulfilled. Now, fulfill to us means something is completed. That's what it means to a Gentile. But to a Jew means continually filled. So when we have a cup, and I do this as an example all the time, if I have a cup of coffee, or you, let's say you, I don't drink coffee, but you have a cup of coffee. I'll pretend you like coffee. So, <laughs> so you got a cup of coffee, and I fill it to the brim. Can't fit another drop in it. You take a sip. Well, to, to, to a Jew, fulfilling means to continually fill full. So when you take a sip, I come over right back to you and fill that back up to the lip. You take another drink, I do the same. That is a picture of the cares of this life wear you down. You go to work, you go to the grocery store, people pull out in front of you, people bang into your car with a, with a, with a grocery cart. Um, things happen. Sometimes people throw stones on the side of your fender. Well, so, so um, those things wear you down to it where it takes, it takes energy for you, it takes energy from you to, to continually exude love and patience and long-suffering and joy and peace and all those things, all those fruits of the Spirit in Galatians. But, um, but when the Holy Spirit is there, the Holy Spirit being in the Jewish concept, fulfillment means that when someone throws a stone and hits your car and, it, and it's drawing you down, your cup is becoming depleted, the Holy Spirit's right there to fulfill or bring full again your cup. So he is there to bring back the joy, the peace, the long suffering, all of those things. But we can't do that without seeking it. If we don't seek it, there's nobody there to fill it. But one of the things, Jesus promises a lot. He promises us everything. One of those promises is, if you seek me, you shall find me. So in these times when we lose our job or the economy is going terrible or, or people are just aren't behaving the way they should or we have family troubles or we have whatever, when we have all of those issues, if we seek God even in those times, then... Holy Spirit will continue to feel full. Make sense? That's the whole purpose. One of the main purposes for seeking God is to continually be filled full so that we can live like Jesus wants us to live, like live the way Jesus lived. People will say, I've had so many, especially pastors say to me, that's impossible. We can't live without sinning. I said, again, why do you take such pleasure in calling Jesus a liar? He told the woman at the well, go and sin no more. If, if it wasn't possible, then he lied. But he doesn't lie. So it has to be possible. I mean, it's, he's, she's not the only one he said that to. So it is possible. If you look at 1 John chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, it says, if you sin, be quick to repent of your sin. If. It didn't say when you sin. It says if you sin. Be quick to repent. I know I'm way off track right now, but I, th I think it's necessary, especially in the times we're living in. Oh, boy. This is going to be a two- or three-parter, I think. Okay, still on Matthew 25. Now, while the bridegroom was taking a long time, they all got drowsy and started falling asleep. But in the middle of the night, there was a shout. Look, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins um, got up and trimmed their lamps. Now the foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, since our lamps are going out. Well, what was going out? <coughs> they might be hungover. 
They might, they might be ashamed of what they did the night before. Um, um, any of those things could be, and it would have been at night that the bridegroom came, so maybe they were ashamed of anything they did yesterday. But they're saying, I need more Holy Spirit because the bridegroom is coming. Where, is, where, where can I get some of your oil? How can I have some of that? But it's too late because seeking doesn't just happen in a second. You can't just summon a, a seeking moment. Seeking is diligent. We, look at what we're doing right now. Using, using, so far we're only on three, three different options so far. We've just started on Drash. We went through Peshat and Ramez. Those are the two easy ones. Now you get into Drash and the Sod, and, and all of a sudden things become much more complicated. So we really need to focus. Now I, I had planned on talking about this is, this is the, these 25 virgins are a marriage ritual. Now if you look at a marriage ritual, this is, this is actually talking about the culmination of the engagement. But the engagement happened a year earlier. Um, and in that engagement, the, the, the groom and the bride's father, th these are Galilean wedding I'm talking now, and every one of the disciples and Jesus were Galilean. So they would have followed this method of, of marriage. Um, that the, the, bride, the groom would have came, come to an arrangement with the father of the bride on how much her dowry should be and we think, and we as Gentiles, we mess everything up because we don't think like Jews we, and we don't think it's important and we think we were, half the church, supposedly church anyway, thinks that we replace the Jews. Well, good luck with that. Um, but, um, but in that dowry, it had nothing, we as Gentiles made it a purchase so that we could treat a, our wives any way we wanted to. They were our property. Well, that's what we thought. That's not what God thought. That's not what the rules that God gave to the Jewish people. That was a promissory insurance policy that that father of the bride was to take this money. And there are different, cult, different factions of Jews that have different principles on, on how all this is done. But these were Galileans. And this is a Galilean wedding. And that's what Jesus is referencing, a Galilean wedding. Because he is Galilean. So... Um, his mother and father, well, his earthly father and his mother would have honored this tradition, and they did. That's why Joseph would have had to write her a letter of divorce um, because she was pregnant, and they couldn't see each other until that day. Um, so um, the, this dowry was supposed to be an insurance policy that if the husband died prematurely, that this money was to go to the bride, it wasn't the father's property of the bride, and it wasn't it wasn't a a cash payment for purchase price. It was an insurance policy that if he died, she would be well taken care of the rest of his life. That was his promise to her, and she had to had to agree with the amount that he was offering. And we know that because in a Galilean wedding. Um, he would, he would, his father would be with him and her father would be with her. And when he would ask his father for the cup and, and he, his father would pull the cup out from his pocket of his robe. And then, and then his father would reach over and grab wine, pour it in the cup. And then he would propose to the, the bride. And at this point, she had an option. If she said no, game over, everybody went back to their corners. But if she, if she didn't say a word, but she would take the cup from his hand, and she had to take it with both hands, because one hand, even if she had big enough hands to do it, um, means she's not all in. But when you take it with both hands, it's saying, I am all in. She would take that cup and drink it, and the husband would then say, this now, uh, he, would, he would drink it. And then he would say, now that was just in her is now in me and we have become one. So at that point, the, the, that, that portion of the marriage is complete. 
they, they did go at this point, go back to their corners. And she, for the next year, would have to work for whatever wages she could find and buy pots, pans, dishes, whatever for the house. And he had to go back to his father's house and prepare a place for his bride. Now, what did Jesus say I'm going to do? He said, I'm going to go to my father's house and prepare a place for you. So approximately one year later, the, the, um, the, the uh, groom would announce to his father that that room is now complete for his bride. And then the father of the groom would let the father of the bride know that that room is ready. In, in, in a day, in a time when no man knew the hour, um, those people would come. The bride, groom, and his p wedding party would come to get the bride. But she had to have her ten virgins waiting in the house with her. And then they would come. And then um, the, 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 the bride, groom, could not go onto the property of the bride's father. Um, she, he had to stand in, they had to stand in the street and call to the bride to come to him. Well, what does Jesus say? I will stand in a cloud and I will call, come. And then we are raptured. So this is a picture of the rapture being brought out from the house into the street. And then they go back to the, the father of the groom's house and provide a seven-day wedding. But in, after the wedding ceremony, the bride and the groom go into that room that the man created for her for seven days. On the seventh day, they would come out. And they would announce to everybody. And I think it's interesting that those are seven days and the tribulation is seven days of years. Seven weeks of years. That's the term used in the book of Daniel. So I say all that because that is a type and a shadow of a marriage. And that marriage brings about exactly, there was no relations going on before the marriage. And that's why they, they come together and they, they do not alter the purpose of that very first verse that we talked about because it can't if it can't then our understanding of this verse is wrong or our understanding of the, ver the original verses so you're, you're seeing how complicated this can be but it's really quite simple that no matter what my opinion is if I insert an opinion it's going to be glaring when I compare it to all the other scripture verses it's not going to fit I, when I was young, I used to, um, my, my aunt lived, she was single, never had kids or a husband. She, and she was a retired nurse from the military and from the city of Grand Rapids. So she would live upstairs. She loved these big 5,000 piece puzzles. So there were, she would have card tables all over the living room with partially finished puzzles on them. And I'm four, five, six years old and I'd go up there and I'd help her put them together. Well, at four, five, six, you don't really quite get the concept but she would set the box cover up there and say, this is what it's supposed to look like. Well, I would start trying to fit a piece in there. And son of a gun, those pieces are this big. But a lot of them look like they should fit. But when you're four and they don't fit, but they look like they should fit, something's wrong. So I would pound it with my fist until it popped in. It would bend the paint, the, the whatever the picture is on the front a little bit, or it would do, and, but it would, it would actually snap in eventually. And so, you would get to that and then you get to the last 20 pieces and son of a gun, you couldn't find a place for them because you already used their spot. Um, and then you might have to pound some more in somewhere else. And, and I thought I really did a good job until I compared what I had put together to the picture on the box. And they didn't look anything alike. You know, you got a horse with a pigtail. You got, you know, you got a rabbit that looks like a moose. You got whatever. It just, it just wasn't right. So if, if I make an opinion on something, and, and you can see with this system, it really stands out that that pig shouldn't have a moose set of antlers. Or, you know, the picture just doesn't fit. I'm going to keep going. Um, Matthew 25, Drush. Uh, but the wise ones replied, no, there won't be enough for us and for you. Instead, Go to those who sell and buy some of you for yourself. Now go seek God yourself. Go see what you can find. Get to know him. Have a relationship. That's what it, that's what it takes. 
<coughs> but while they were go uh, going off to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Now later the other virgins came, saying, Sir, sir, open it up for us. Now, these people, you know, all of a sudden at the last minute, after the rapture occurs, they're going to realize, what did we just do? This, this, we know the prophecies. We know, we heard all these stories. But we were part of those who were fulfilled in, in 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter's talking to the people in the church. And he said, in the, in the last days, many scoffers shall come. He's talking about inside the church. I can't tell you how many people I've tried to witness to, not in my church, but in other, but people that claim to be followers of Christ who go to other churches, denominations. And we talk about end times. Oh, nobody understands end times. We're, we don't have to worry about that. That's not in my lifetime. I'll never see that. You might see the back end of it. So, you know, there's going to be, the majority of people will miss the, the rapture. The, more, the majority of people that, that, I, that are on this earth right now that will see the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, which is a place, will go through beheading rather than rapture. It's going to be a small number that go in a rapture. First of all, the rapture in, in Luke 21, 36 says, be, pray that you be found worthy to escape the wrath to come. So that means it's a blessing. So if, it, if it's a blessing, then it falls in line with all the other blessings. If you don't believe in healing, can you be healed? No. If you don't believe in speaking in tongues, will you ever speak in tongues? No. If you don't believe in prophecy, will you ever prophesy? No. If you don't believe in a rapture, will you ever be raptured? No. So I say, if you don't, don't please don't say, I don't believe in a rapture. Say, I don't, I don't see a support for it yet, I may, it, but, it, but it could be. Because the moment you say, I don't believe in a rapture, all of a sudden now you are excluded from being in the rapture. That's a dangerous propagation proposition but he replied amen I tell you I do not know you therefore stay alert for you know neither the day nor the hour and we've talked about this before that's Rosh Hashanah it's a two day festival um, a feast day of Israel in which um, I won't go into the depth of it but um, the literal meaning of that day is the time in which no man knew the day or the hour um, Mark chapter 2, and Yehoshua Jesus said to them, The guests of the bridegroom cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them. Can they? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast in that day. Now, I like this part. We're talking about sowed now, which is a type and a shadow. Revelation 19, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made him herself ready. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the Kedoshim, the righteous. Revelation 19 again, then the angel tells me, write how fortunate are those who have been invited to the wedding banquet of the Lamb. He also tells me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that, for I am only a fellow servant with you and your brothers and sisters who hold the testimony of, Ye of Jesus, Yehoshua, um, worship God for the testimony of Yehoshua, Jesus, is the spirit of prophecy. <coughs> I love this because it talks about don't don't worship me. I'm one of you, a fellow servant. Now, if, if you see in in uh, Revelation 22, it's around verse 12, 12 or 13. Um, John falls again, and the in the in the servant who is giving him a tour of heaven pulls him up. It says, "Do do not do that." I am like you, a fellow prophet, he says. So I believe wholeheartedly that the person that is giving um, John a tour of heaven is Daniel. 
because if you look in the book in Revelation chapter 10, we see the same image that we see an angel, I believe it's Jesus, a Christophany, who is standing with one foot on the land and one foot on the sea. But um, in Daniel, it's one foot over the land and one foot over the sea. The difference being, in Daniel, he says, do, do not uh, close up the meaning of this book. The time is not yet. Well, Jesus, th that angel, which I believe is Jesus, is not touching the ground, we, meaning everything has significance in Scripture. Because it's not touching the ground means it's not time yet. But then when you see him in Revelation, he is touching the ground. And he says to Daniel, in, in, in Daniel, he says, seal up the meaning of this book. But in Revelation chapter 22, he says, do not seal up the meaning of this book because the time is now. That's why the angel, the, Jesus' feet are touching the water and the land. Ephesians 5, for the husband is head of the wife, as Messiah also is head of his community, um, himself the savior of the body. But as Messiah's community is submitted to Messiah, so also the wives to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Messiah also loved his community. I think this is interesting because it's a Jewish perspective. And gave himself up for her to make her holy, having cleansed her by immersion in the word. Now see, we're talking again about seeking. Immersion in the word is actually being baptized in the word of God, seeking everything that he has talked about and who Jesus is. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her cut off her hair. But, if, but if, if it is shameful for a woman to have her hair cut off or to be shaved, let her cover her head. Now, um, I'll go to this. For surely a man ought to not cover his head since he is the image and the glory of God. Because it says um, not, that a man should not go into the sanctuary with his head covered because Jesus is the cover of the man. But a woman should not go into a sanctuary with her head uncovered because her, her covering is her husband. And that is saying that, that God will hold every husband responsible for his family's um, hearing the righteous, a man of God, we'll put it that way. Because if, 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 if we are going to churches that have a false teacher, someone who is not preaching the word, who is not leading your family, not... It is God is going to hold the, the husband responsible for doing that. That doesn't mean that the women and the children get a free pass into heaven. It just means there's extra judgment for the man who allows that to happen. We as husbands are mandated that we must know the word of God so that we can protect our children and our wives against people teaching false doctrines. For a man is not from woman, but a woman from man. Boy, you can hear women live all over that, can you? On the last and greatest day of the feast, Yehoshua, Jesus, now they're talking about Sukkot, um, Yehoshua stood up and cried out loudly, <coughs> if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Now, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop right here. Thanks, Dan. I'm going to stop right here, and uh, we're going to call it good. We'll pick up from this point next time. I thank everyone for tuning in and I would love to say that if you don't know Jesus, if you've never accepted Jesus, I would ask you at this point, don't wait. You never know what tomorrow will bring. I'm not saying Jesus is coming tomorrow. What I am saying is a truck might. You could be walking across the street, you could be driving and, and fall asleep at the wheel. You, there's a lot of things that can happen. Why take a risk? Don't put off today um, what could kill you tomorrow. And I mean second death as we're talking in there. So I'm going to ask, if you don't know Jesus, I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent your son Jesus. I believe that, that he is the son of God. He came and he died and he shed his blood for the forgiveness of my sins. I receive that, I believe that, and I 
and, and I praise him and I will follow him all the days of my life and I will glorify him in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for watching.